Welcome to lesson one in microeconomics. The title of this lesson or this chapter is Introduction, the Big Ideas. So our objective here is to establish what the main objectives of the discipline of economics are and also to describe the methods that we use in economics to explore these ideas and meet certain policy objectives. At the beginning of each lesson in this series, we will attempt to establish what the objectives of the lesson are at the beginning of the lesson. So let us outline what our objectives are going to be for this particular lecture. We will start by trying to find a good definition of economics. So we'll explore the nature and objective of economics. A central part of our course is going to deal, deal with how we formally explore the ideas in economics. So we will develop analytical frameworks which will involve theory, models, hypotheses, and data. These constitute the scientific end of economics. Even though this course is primarily concerned with the functioning of markets and how individual individuals and producers deal with one another in the economy, we cannot underestimate the importance of government. Governments are important for a whole variety of reasons and we will stress this as we progress through the lessons. We will then simply describe how microeconomics differs from macroeconomics and a large part of this lesson will be concerned with the analytical tools used in economics. The analytical tools center upon an understanding of the marketplace, how individuals exchange goods and services with one another, how producers and buyers specialize in accordance with the notions of productivity advantage. And finally, we will conclude with some observations about macroeconomics. The best definition of economics that I have been able to find in the literature comes from an economist, Christopher Sims, who won the Nobel Prize in economics in 2011. It's a very nice, succinct statement of what economics is about and how economics might be different from other disciplines. Christopher Sims says economics is about a set of ideas and it is also about methods. So it's a set of ideas and a set of methods for examining how we might be able to improve society, how we might be able to improve our collective lives. It is not, he emphasizes, a set of ideological rules. It is not this. In the context of the current world, we are faced with the hangover from the recession that started worldwide in about 2008. So we do have worldwide problems at the present time that deal with stagnation, also with job losses, and, of course, widening inequality. So we are faced with a series of major problems in the modern world, and what we will attempt to do in this course is to explore methods of confronting these particular problems. Economics, then, is a social science. It is social in that it is concerned with ideas that may improve the way our society functions. It is also scientific. And we can describe three ways in which economics is scientific. First of all, economics uses mathematics. But don't be too concerned about this. The mathematics that will be used in this course is very elementary. We will use no more than linear equations to describe the behaviors that we're examining. We will frequently solve for two linear equations to get a solution. 
but we will no, use no more mathematics than that. The second way in which economics is scientific is that we use economic models. A model is a way of representing a set of ideas that we embody in a theory. A model is a way of stating the essentials of a theory or the essentials of, hypo of a hypothesis without allowing the process to become too complicated. So what we do very frequently in economics is we try to focus on the central ideas of an argument or the central ideas of an analysis. And if we can write down the central ideas in a formal way, then we have a model of the issue that we're thinking about. Now, if we are concerned with the improvement of society and if we are concerned with testing ideas, perhaps through their formulation, formalization by means of a model, we also would like to be able to confirm if these ideas are borne out in practice or not. And the way in which we do this is we collect data and we use statistical analysis. So if we have ideas or thoughts or philosophies or theories and we set this out, these out in a model of the economy and we want to verify these ideas, we have to collect data and do some statistical analysis on the data. So these are the ways in which economics might be considered to be a science. What are the big challenges for us today? Obviously, unemployment rates are very high, particularly among young people in specific economies. For example, if we look at unemployment rates among young people in some of the southern European Union economies, we find unemployment rates as high as 30 or 40 percent. This is a very, very serious issue. We also find that government balance sheets are in disarray. What we mean by that is that many governments are running large deficits in their current, in their current operations, and they have accumulated large outstanding debts. Governments cannot continue to accumulate debts indefinitely. It is also the case that inequality is on the rise in many developed and even less developed economies. In addition to these problems that we have been experiencing in the last decade or two, we have longer term challenges facing us. The world is very heavily populated and economists and other scientists are concerned about the world's ability to sustain the current population it has and the growth in population it will experience over the next few decades. Every day we read in the media about climate change. What can we do about the emission of greenhouse gases so that we do not endanger our future? We observe all around us political instability. And then, of course, there is the issue of globalization. Does the globalization of the market economy really improve the world, or does it just improve the well-being of a small number of people? Indeed, then, the world is faced with a large number of very serious challenges. However, we shouldn't think that it's all bad news. If we examine literacy rates in the world over the last several decades, we see that these are rising at a dramatic rate in the developing world. It's also the case that child mortality has dropped precipitously in less developed economies. As a consequence, families are having a smaller number of children, and that, bears, that is good for the future of the world if we think that it is overpopulated at the present time. It is also the case that in many less developed economies, poverty is being eradicated and prosperity is on the rise. This is particularly true in Asia. If we look at life expectancy statistics worldwide, we see that life expectancy is increasing dramatically, particularly in a lot of the less developed economies. So there is a lot of very good news out there. Whatever we have been doing in the last several decades, it has borne fruit in the form of rising literacy rates, lower child mortality, lower family size, prosperity, and higher life expectancy. 
In this course, we will focus on microeconomics, but it would be useful at this point to distinguish between microeconomics and macroeconomics. The two names are suggestive. When we talk about macroeconomics, we are talking about large systems. So macroeconomics studies the economy as a system in which there are feedbacks and interactions among sectors of the economy. And in macroeconomics, we determine what the factors are that determine national output, employment levels, prices, and so forth. Microeconomics, on the other hand, is a study of individual behavior, and we like to add that it's the study of individual behavior in the context of scarcity. So in microeconomics, we are initially concerned with the study of individuals, the study of producers, the study of buyers, the study of corporations, and how all of these um, agents act in the face of scar scarcity and how these agents act given that they face incentives. Most modern economies are what we call mixed economies. Even though we will focus heavily on the usefulness of markets in this course, we mustn't forget that a very large part of, good, of the goods and services consumed and supplied in the modern economy is done so by the government. The government in Canada is responsible for education, health, pensions, welfare, and so forth. The government is also responsible for ensuring that law and order exists, and if we did not have law and order and a system within which contracts were respected by all parties entering into contracts, we would not have a very successful market economy. So even though we will focus heavily on the usefulness of markets, that is not to say that governments don't play a major role and that governments aren't necessary for the successful operation of markets.